Good afternoon. I'm Margaret Baruti. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give today is entitled Considerations Thanks regarding singing voice sessions for the injured voice versus the healthy voice. First of all, I'd like to thank the Voice Foundation, Dr. Sadaloff Ron Shearer, for allowing me to come and talk about these issues. Um, some thoughts concerning the challenges and responsibilities facing singing teachers who work with both healthy and injured voices. It's important to have clarity in our perception of what it is to what is required to work with injured voices versus healthy voices. As a singing teacher who maintains a private voice studio but is also a singing voice specialist in a voice medicine clinic, I've come to the conclusion that while there are many areas of commonality dealing with both the healthy and the injured singer, there are some very important differences that deserve our careful consideration. First, we need to briefly review the current training protocols and expectations for both the singing teacher and the singing voice specialist, which is the term I'm going to use today for any singing teacher who has received specialized training to work with injured voices. Let's start with the education of the singing teacher. Most of us would prefer, how many singing teachers in the audience, by the way? We're trying to get a demographic, oh great, perfect. Most of us would prefer that a singing teacher have at least an undergraduate degree in vocal performance and or pedagogy and an extensive professional or semi-professional singing experience before going into teaching. I think I can say with reasonable assurance that these same qualifications are desired in a singing voice specialist. In addition, extensive experience in the teaching of singing is an invaluable asset to the singing voice specialist. Both the singing teacher and the singing voice specialist need acute oral discernment, a broad knowledge of vocal technique, and an extensive box of pedagogical skills. Unfortunately, because neither of these disciplines requires any kind of licensing, anybody can hang out a shingle and call themselves either a singing teacher or a singing voice specialist. Now let's consider our first real area of difference between these two vocations. It is in regard to the ethical responsibilities of the singing voice specialist. The singing voice specialist will be working with injured voices, hopefully with injuries that have been medically diagnosed. The process of working with an injured voice carries with it implied, though not as yet re regulated, medical and possibly legal repercussions. While it's possible that a healthy voice can experience vocal injury related to improper teaching, an injured voice is even more vulnerable and therefore requires a more specific intervention to promote a safe and successful outcome. So from the onset, the stakes are higher when working with an injured voice than with a healthy voice. Therefore, this is where the training of the singing voice specialist must be augmented. The singing voice specialist requires coursework in anatomy, neuroanatomy and physiology of the voice, as well as voice disorders, current treatment modalities used in the remediation of voice disorders, and instrumentation for voice analysis. Most of the current training programs, um, programs training people to work with injured voices do require some measure of all of these. Now here's where things get a little bit tricky. It's one thing to digest a body of information. It's another thing to know how to apply that information in an effective way. We all know from personal experience that we learn to teach by teaching. Singing teachers and singing voice specialists have that in common. Voice pedagogy students in college often get at least a limited amount of directly supervised time teaching singing students. Speech pathologists are required to go through many hours of supervised hands-on training before they can get licensed. It is equally important then that someone who is going to work with injured singer singing voices has an extended period of hands-on patient time that is supervised by an experienced singing voice specialist. It is my opinion that it is not enough to learn some fact-based information concerning voice and then merely observe a good singing voice specialist at work. If there's singing teachers in the audience or anyone else who'd like to discuss current training programs or what's on the horizon with regard to this, please don't hesitate to talk to me later in the week. Now let's look at some of the things that we need to consider when actually working with the singer. The easiest way to cover this material with you today is to walk you through what I do with healthy 
and injured voices and to explain my considerations with each. I always take a thorough history from anyone that I'm going to work with. From both groups, I gather information on their singing training, current complaints or concerns about their voice, medical history, including any prescription drugs or alternative health treatments, exercise routine, sleep habits, alcohol, tobacco, recreational drugs, etc. I keep detailed session notes on both groups. However, when dealing with an injured voice, particular care must be taken to document the sessions, as more often than not, these notes end up in the medical record of the injured singer. With both groups, I think it's critical to establish an atmosphere of trust and understanding, and I use the history taking as an opportunity to create that sort of open communication. This is especially uh, important for the injured singer who is usually very emotionally fragile and could be in one of the most vulnerable places of their lives. An area of difference. With the injured singer, I will review the physician's diagnosis because often in the trauma of the moment, the singer has not fully comprehended the specifics of the diagnosis and its possible ramifications. At that point, I'll also make it clear that I intend to stick with the injured singer until they no longer desire or require my input. As a singing voice specialist, I make myself their advocate. I let the singer know that I, in conjunction with a physician, can help them handle all issues sur surrounding the injury, including possible performance cancellations, what to tell teachers, colleagues, managers, and others, as well as how to establish a timetable for returning to normal voice use. In our office, we established the concept of the voice team comprised of at least the physician, the singing voice specialist, and the speech language pathologist. We make it clear to the singer that our team goal is to enable the singer's return to healthy singing. This is particularly important because there is little in the way of a support system available to injured singers. Another role of the singing voice specialist, I think, is to act as a translator and intermediary, intermediary between the singer and the voice doctor. And this because of problems that can arise related to medical versus singing terminology and perspective. Now, returning to the initial evaluation. With a healthy singer, I ask for a demonstration of their singing, usually in the form of their warm-up and some repertoire. There are no restrictions on what they can demonstrate. I need a clear understanding of their habitual approach to the voice. For the injured singer, what, what they are allowed to demonstrate is dictated by the pathology or where they are in a surgical process. If a singer has had a vocal fold hemorrhage or is post vocal fold surgery and this is their first singing session, I'm going to establish very strict controls on how we explore the voice. This would include limited range and volume on very simple scale patterns of my choice. Well, I tend to pick the vowel that's easiest for them to sing at the onset. I also ask them to demonstrate what, is, what they consider their worst vowel. At this point, I'm only trying to safely acquire a baseline on what the voice can do comfortably. If the pathology is vocal fold masses or scar or paresis, I will have the injured singer demonstrate their habitual approach through warm-up and repertoire and will encourage them to allow me to hear the problem. It's a difficult psychological hurdle for the injured singer to allow someone, especially a virtual stranger, to hear what is wrong with their voice. I spend a lot of time helping the injured singer understand that in order to correct their vocal problem, they have to let go of their habitual aesthetic oral criteria for their voice and be willing to rely on the technical approach that we will establish. They have to accept that we're gonna focus on optimal technique regardless of the resulting tone and that this will be the best and fastest way back to healthy voice. As we move back to technical work, we discover, discover another area of difference. With both groups, I'm trying to establish optimum vocal technique. With the healthy voice, when the technique improves, the voice quality, range, etc., will usually show some identifiable level of improvement that the singer can recognize. With the injured voice, however, very often the better the technique, the worse the sound. This is a critical difference that I want to emphasize. Too often I see an injured singer whose teacher has been trying to eliminate, say, the breathiness in the voice using very aggressive adductory vocal fold exercises. 
In the case of vocal foam masses, this well-meaning but misguided approach has only served to make the masses worse because of the more forceful closure action of the vocal folds. I will say that many teachers are extremely astute and attuned to efficient vocal production, and they wisely send the singer for a medical evaluation when a healthy technical approach has failed to eliminate the perceived vocal problem. But the possible phenomenon of better technique initially producing worse sound is a critical part of the understanding that the singing voice specialist brings to the table. With both groups, I believe that the identification and elimination of negative muscle tension is of paramount importance. In a healthy singer, most teachers will address issues of jaw, tongue, pharyngeal, neck, body tension, and the healthy singer will often get immediately better voice or at least acquire a sense of freer voice production when the tension is lessened. This negative tension is harder to remediate in the injured singer because it is usually present in direct response to the pathology. I have found that the vocal system has a certain common set of responses to a problem at the level of the vocal folds. These responses can include excessive muscle tension in the jaw, tongue, pharynx, and larynx. There can be hyperfunction beyond the vocal tract, such as in the support system, which often goes into overdrive in the effort to correct the dysphonia. It's not uncommon among voice injury patients that the counterproductive compensatory muscle tension that is developed in response to the initial injury, that tension then becomes a principal source of at least part of the dysphonia, or poor voice. Depending on how long the singer has had the problem, there can be significant tension in the musculature of the neck, shoulders, and entire upper torso. Even when the voice has begun to recover, the injured singer will often retain a sort of bracing throughout the vocal system, perhaps in fear of incurring another injury. It's important to help the singer identify and release this limiting element. Psychologically, the healthy singer may feel insecure about his or her voice, but there's usually a level of confidence in what has been achieved before they came to me. With a healthy voice, the singer has come to me because they want me to become their teacher and provide new technical guidance. Subsequently, I feel freer to express my opinion about their habitual technique, uh, and I do not hesitate to implement changes in that technique. The injured singer often feels not only technically insecure, but also defensive about their technique, and perhaps even whether it led to the injury. The singer may also already have a teacher, so I make every effort to voice my observations respectfully and diplomatically. I also make it clear that it's not my job to become their teacher, but rather to help them back to healthy voice so that they may return to their teacher. There are occasions when the technical changes that I ask the injured singer to make appear to be in opposition to the instruction of their teacher. In those instances, I rely on the singer's ability to judge which approach allows for easier production. A singing voice specialist should never badmouth another teacher. That's a terrible precedent, and it has the potential to create a situation where teachers no longer feel safe sending their students for appropriate medical evaluation and treatment. On those rare occasions when I believe the teacher is giving harmful instruction, I will offer to talk to the teacher in order to explain my concerns, and I will sometimes tactfully suggest that the singer reconsider their old technique in light of what we've accomplished with a different approach. Now, of huge importance to every singer is the timetable for results. The healthy singer will often ask when he or she can expect the full benefits of the changes we are making. Most singers are aware that the art of singing is a process and that the timetable for benefits is variable. However, with the healthy voice, most technical improvements produce results that are recognizably beneficial early in the process, even if the full benefit is somewhere down the road. Additionally, most healthy singers can continue to perform while adjusting to new technical concepts. The injured singer always wants to know when he or she will be able to return to their full singing demands, and this, in my opinion, is one of the toughest questions to answer. 
The timing of recovery is influenced by many, many factors, including the type of the pathology, surgical outcome, the singer's compliance with instructions, the vocal demands that will need to be met down the road, the singer's own biology and healing, just to name a few. A big complaint that I have heard from many uh, recovered singers is that the time frame for return to work given by the voice doctor was too short. Now, I think, I think ENTs who specialize in voice do this for a good reason. However, it creates a problem. This is a problem because if the singer is not ready to return to their former vocal demands in the time frame suggested by the physician, the singer often feels that they are failing and what's more, if they do return too early, they can experience a setback. I, in consult with a physician, will always appraise the singer not only of the shortest possible time for return, but also the longest. This has always proven to be an effective strategy. Now, let's discuss vocal exercises. In both groups, healthy and injured, I will use various stretching exercises to release unwanted body tension. This may include full body stretches, neck stretches, tongue and jaw release exercises. With both groups, I often spend time on facial jaw and neck and laryngeal massage, but injured singers seem to need more attention in these particular areas. Postural instruction is the same for both groups, with added stress for the uh, injured voices on the importance of body alignment. Most singers come in with some established method of breath support. It is not uncommon, however, for the singer, healthy or injured, to be unable to correctly describe exactly what they're doing or think they are doing with regard to their breath support. This is a good time to mention the elephant in the room, and that is that singers often have less factual information about the structure and the function of their instrument than any other musician. Granted, the human voice is a complex instrument, but this is all the more reason for singers to have as much factual understanding as possible about how it works. I never assume that the singer understands the actual function of their vocal instrument. With both groups, I have a responsibility to help educate the singer about the basics of the anatomy and physiology of the voice, as well as general rules of vocal hygiene. Now, here we go. Anyone in the voice teaching world knows that there can be strongly differing opinions on the best method of breath support. If you want to get voice teachers in a fight, just bring up that issue and, and what, what's the right way to support your voice. Starting with the inhalation, with both groups of singers, I work to ensure that the singer is able to allow a released inhalation with appropriate diaphragmatic descent and sensations of expansion throughout the torso with no accompanying tension in the neck and shoulders. As I mentioned earlier, in the injured singer, the breath support system has often become very hyperfunctional and or braced. Therefore, this group may require more time devoted to the elimination of these areas of muscle tension. Body stretching exercises, muscle contraction and release maneuvers, especially in the abdominal region, referral for Alexander and Feldenkrais, as well as massage, are examples of concepts employed with both groups for the release of tension. As for the exhale, many voice teachers agree about the inhale, but then there's a big fight about how you, what you do when you exhale. In the healthy singer, especially the classical singer, I teach a breath management system that includes the engagement of inhalatory muscles during exhalation. This generally involves the sensation of maintaining an expanded rib cage while expelling air, often referred to as a poggio or some form of a poggio. With the injured singer, having assessed what method of breath support they've been using, I try to work with what is familiar to them, assuming it is reasonably effective. There are many CCM or non-classical singers who have successfully used a breath support system that does not utilize much appoggio, this engagement of inhalatory muscles during exhalation. Though I may introduce this method to the injured singers, I do not insist upon its application as I do with the healthy classical singer. What's important for my work with the injured singer is to help them regain a breath support effort that involves minimal tension, yet supplies appropriate airflow. The engagement of abdominal musculature to facilitate the exhalatory effort is always stressed. 
Here's a very important area of commonality. I want every singer to be able to kinesthetically identify the sensation of a neutral throat. The feeling that during phonation, there's no strain, effort, discomfort, or any negative sensation in the area of the larynx or pharynx. This might be the single most important point of reference for any seeker, singer seeking healthy, efficient voice production. Exercises contrasting intentionally closed throat with an over-open throat during inhalation gesture can be helpful. The old standby yawn sigh maneuver is a good tool. The release of throat tension can be more difficult for the injured than the healthy singer and may take more time to establish. But without it, the injured singer's progress may be impeded and the risk for re-injury is higher. So while we as teachers may mistakenly overlook slightly pressed phonation in the healthy singer, this cannot be allowed in the injured singer. The focus on release of throat tension leads to the consideration of the balance of what I call space versus place in efficient singing. In the classical world, teachers often fall into two groups with regard to whether they put more emphasis on the feelings of open space, including back of the mouth and open throat, or whether they emphasize more the sensations of mask, face, or frontal vibration. I believe that both elements are important, an important part of good singing. With both groups, injured and healthy, I will work on establishing appropriate oral pharyngeal space to allow for the full enhancement of the vocal tone. This must always be balanced with work on sensations of anterior and frontal or mask vibration. Some injured singers are able to more quickly establish free phonation using this anterior or frontal tonal focus sensations, while others respond better to the addition of more open posterior space. And this can change in the course of the remediation work. An important observation that I've made over the years is that if the vocal folds are compromised, the source sound they are able to produce may not create frontal sensations of vibration. Injured singers will very often complain that their voice no longer has the ring or overtone, and almost everyone comes in and says that they cannot feel any longer the sensation of sound in the frontal part of the skull. It is a mistake to try and force this vibratory sensation. So I work to encourage it keeping in mind any limitations of the vocal folds that might interfere with the creation at the level of the source sound. Now, on to vocal exercises. The exercises used for both groups, healthy and injured, are similar, if sometimes not exactly the same. The difference is in the application of the exercises with regard primarily to range, volume, duration, and general demand that they place on the vocal folds. These parameters are determined by my subjective judgment of what the injured voice can handle at any given time in the process. Both the singing teacher and the singing voice specialist benefit tremendously from a large toolbox from which to choose exercise protocols. It is never one size fits all. In both groups, I like to use lip and tongue trills, I like trills because I believe that when done correctly on gentle ascending and descending glides and scales, they're like a light stretch class for the vocal folds. Admittedly, I don't have hard evidence to prove this, but I believe that the adductory force is potentially less when doing these trills correctly than when singing a vowel. So you get the benefit of the stretch of the vocal folds without the possible wear and tear of greater contact force. This makes these trills an easy and safe way to begin a warm-up with any kind of vocal fold pathology if produced without inappropriate tension. I don't consider them strengthening exercises, just light stretchers. They're also a good way to work on anterior vibratory sensation and unforced breath support. Additionally, they can give the sort of vulnerable and uncertain injured singer a feeling of ease and success with sound production. I have embraced the use of straw phonation, so wonderfully explored by Ingo Tietze and others. Again, this is a tool I use with both groups because of the potential to establish better flow phonation or ease of production. 
I will use them first on chanted sounds and then move into sung glides and scale patterns. I found that they can be easily done with unacceptable levels of muscle tension. So here again is where the singer's ability to self-monitor sensations in the throat region is essential. While I like humming exercises, M's, N's, NG sounds, I have seen too many singers using hyperfunction in an effort to maximize the targeted frontal sensations of vibrations that we're looking for from hums. I am extra careful with both groups, healthy and injured, in monitoring inappropriate tension with this exercise. It's important to remember that even when done with excellent technique, if there is significant glottal insufficiency, poor vocal fold closure, the vocal folds likely cannot produce a source sound that will result in strongly identifiable sensations of frontal or anterior vibration. I use vocal function exercises, the work of Joe Stemple and his team. I use them more with the injured voice than the healthy singer. They were originally designed as a balancing and strengthening of laryngeal muscle concept and are a nice codified system to follow. Some singers continue to use them as part of their warm-up, especially for the speaking voice, long after they've returned to their pre-injury singing demands. I like to use alternating nasal and normal resonance patterns of phonation, first chanted, then sung. I like occluded nasals, like now I know, now I know, back and forth between nasals and non-nasals. I love them. I'll use this with both groups, but selectively. I tend to avoid these er during the early uh, sessions following the removal of vocal fold masses or hemorrhage out of concern regarding forceful vocal fold adduction or closure. While there is speculation in the voice science world about exactly why nasal sounds can lead to better normal tones, when it works there's no question that the singer is able to produce a clearer tone with a better balance in the vibratory sensations and a decrease in laryngeal effort. I use what I consider more strenuous occluded vocal tract exercises with both groups, but again very selectively with the injured singer. I'll use chanted and sung V's or Z's with real resistance with very careful monitoring of pharyngeal and laryngeal tension and breath support effort. You don't want overdrive on any of those. With the injured singer, I tend to use these exercises more often with true glottic closure issues, problems, for example, paresis or significant scar, but I will add them to the protocol of other injured singers when I feel the time is right for strengthening. I do use vocal fry exercise in moderation with both groups. Because of the longer closed phase and the contraction of the interarytenoid muscles that we believe occurs with fry, out of caution, I don't use it early in post-mass excision cases or hemorrhage recovery. I would rather work on gentle stretching and lighter adductory exercises before moving to fry. In general, I like, personally, I like to err on the side of caution and do not want to introduce what might be more lengthy or possibly forceful adductory action until I think the vocal folds are ready to handle it. I will only speak briefly about choosing vowels and scale patterns. With a healthy voice, I feel free to work on all vowels and to use any scale pattern, phonatory gesture, range of dynamic variation that I think will enable the singer to better master their instrument. With the injured voice, I am more selective based on what the voice can comfortably do at any given moment in the recovery process. For instance, I will avoid staccato exercises or a more aggressive vocal fold closure exercises when trying to encourage, say, spontaneous resolution of vocal fold masses or when working with patients immediately following mass excision or hemorrhage. With the injured singer, I will likely spend time working with the vowel that is easiest for them to produce with good technique and has the clearest tone quality. I do require all injured singers to work on the ah vowel which is often the most difficult vowel with which to achieve a satisfying sense of resonance and tonal core. Since I've mentioned the speaking voice, I will say that I address the need for good speaking technique and habits with both groups. With the injured singer, I insist that they work with a speech therapist trained in voice production. 
In our office, these sessions are required of every singer. Abusive speaking habits can cause or exacerbate vocal fold injuries in singers. I make it clear to the injured singer that better speaking habits are imperative for a quicker and more lasting recovery. I would never attempt to remediate speaking voice problems in the injured singer. This is an area of licensed practice for speech pathologists and must be respected as such. If I determine that a healthy singer has poor speaking techniques and habits, I really do urge them to see a speech language pathologist. In conclusion then, this is my goal for both the injured singer and the healthy singer. To teach the singer that at all times, a good technique is the surest path to optimal singing. Thank you. <laughs>